Chapter Six of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six. We were very young to feel such passions as then throbbed within our bosoms, so strong, so keen, so durable. But our hearts had never known any other. They had not been hardened in the petrifying stream of time nor had the world engraved so many lines upon the tablets of feeling as to render them unsusceptible of any deep and defined impression our whole hearts were open to love and we loved with our whole hearts the two days of my stay soon drew to an end and on the morning of the third my horse and that of Hussein, together with a mule for father francis were brought into the courtyard and after receiving my mother's counsel and my father's blessing I mounted and rode forth with few of those pleasurable feelings which I had anticipated in setting out to explore foreign lands. But love was at that moment the predominant feeling in my bosom, and I would have resigned all, abandoned all, to have stayed and passed my life in tranquillity beside Helen. It was not to be, and I went forth, but a sensation of swelling at my heart prevented me from either conversing with Father Francis or noticing the beautiful country through which we travelled a thing seldom lost to my eyes by the time we reached pierre feet however a distance of about ten miles the successive passing of different objects though each but called my attention to the very slightest degree upon the whole began to draw my mind from itself and when proceeding onward we wound our horses through the narrow gorge leading towards luz the magnificent scenery of the pass, with its enormous rocks, its luxuriant woods, and its rushing river, stole from me my feelings of regret, and left me nothing but admiration of the grand and beautiful works which nature had spread around. By the time the day had somewhat waned, for we were obliged to conform our horse's pace to the humour of Father Francis's mule, which was not the most vivacious of animals, the sun had got beyond the high mountains on our right, which, now robed in one vast pall of purple shadow rose like titans against the sky and seemed to cover at least one third of its extent but the western hills still caught the rays and kept glowing with a thousand varied hues as we went along like the quick changes of hope as man advances along the tortuous and varied path of existence amongst other objects on which the sunshine still caught was a little woody mound projecting from the surface of the hill and crowned with an old round tower beginning to fall into ruins as we passed it the good priest who never loved to see me in any of those fits of gloom which sometimes fell upon me the natural placidity of his disposition leading him to miscomprehend the variability of mine pointed out to me the mound and the crumbling tower as the spot where a great victory had been gained over the moors in times long gone and our conversation gradually turned to war and deeds of renown but father francis had abjured the sword and little appreciated the word glory glory my dear louis said he according to the world's acceptation of the world is i am afraid little better in general than the gilding with which mighty robbers cover over great crimes when i was young however i thought like you and i am afraid all young men will think so till reason teaches them that the only true glory which man can have is to be found in the love of his fellow-creatures not in their fears all other glory is but emptiness you remember the italian poet's lines on the field of cannae glory alas what is it but a name go search the records of the years of old and thou shalt find too sure that brightest fame for which hard toiled the skilful and the bold was but a magic gift that none could hold a name traced with an infant's finger in the sand o'er which dark time's effacing waves are rolled a fragile blossom in a giant's hand crushed with a thousand more that die as they expand i stand on cannae here for endless years might fond remembrance dream o'er days pass by tracing this bitter place of many tears but memory too has flown and leaves the eye to rest on naught but bleakness and the sigh to mourn the frailty of man's greatest deeds oh would he learn by truth such deeds to try 
lo how devouring time on conquest feeds forgot the hand that slays forgot the land that bleeds time mighty vaunter thou of all the race that strive for glory o'er thine acts canst raise the monument that never falls and place the ruins of a world to mark thy ways each other conquerors memory decays to heap the pile that comments on thy name thy column rises with increasing days and desolation adds unto thy fame but can i was forgot time tis with thee the same it is astonishing how chilly the words of age fall upon the glowing enthusiasm of youth as we go on through life doubtless we gather all the same cold truths but it is by degrees not all at once as when the freezing experience of many years is poured forth like a sudden fall of snow upon our hearts lucky most lucky it is that we cannot believe the lessons which the old would teach us for certainly if we were as wise when we come into life as we are when we go out of it there would be nothing great and very little good done in the world i mean that there would be no enthusiasm of wish or of endeavour nevertheless there is always some damp rests upon the mind from such views of human existence however warm may be the fire of the heart and when father francis had repeated his lines upon glory he left a weight upon me which i found difficult to throw off we were now near luce and the good father's mule which by the way was the best epitome i ever saw of a selfish and interested spirit as if it entertained a presentiment of approaching hay and oats suffered its sober legs to be seduced into an amble that speedily brought us to the door of the little cabaret where we were to pass the night the accommodations which its appearance promised were not of the most exquisite description and one must have been very charitable to suppose it contained anything better than pumpkin soup and goose's thighs father francis however was tired and exhausted with a longer ride than he had taken for more than fifty years Houssay was an old soldier and i was too young and in too high health to trouble myself much about the quality of my entertainment dismounting then our horses were led into the stable and we ourselves were shown to the room of general reception which we found already tenanted by a fat monk all grease and jollity and a thin gentleman in black who for grimness and solemnity looked like a mourning sword in a black scabbard it seemed as if nature having made a more fat and jovial man than ordinary in the capuchin had been fain to patch up his companion out of the scrapings of her dish father francis did not appear to like the couple and indeed he had reason for it wanted no great skill in physiognomy to read in the jovial countenance of the monk a very plain history of the sort of self-denial and sensual mortification which he practised on himself as for his companion had i known as much of the world as i do now i should instantly have understood him to be one of those solemn villains who if they sometimes lose a good opportunity by want of conversational powers often catch many a gull by their gravity and escape many an error into which a talkative rascal is sure to fall by his very volubility however i was at an age when every one more or less pays for experience and if i took upon me to judge the pair of worthies before me i did not judge them rightly immediately after our entrance father francis as i have said being very much fatigued retired to bed whispering to me that i had better get my supper and follow his example as soon as i could to this however i was not very well inclined my stock of animal powers for the day not being yet half exhausted and as i saw the aubergiste beginning to place on the table before the monk and his companion various savoury dishes for which my ride had provided an appetite i whispered to Houssay and proposed to them to join their table the matter was soon arranged my capuchin professing a taste for good cheer and good company somewhat opposed to his vows of fasting and meditation and my thin cavalier laying his hand on his heart and making the most solemn bow that his stiff backbone could achieve the viand set before us offered a very palatable contradiction to what the appearance of the house had promised and the conversation was as savoury as the dishes for the monk was a man whose fat and happiness overflowed in a jocose and merry humour 
and even the thin person in black, though his mustachios were rather of a grave cast, would occasionally venture a dry and solemn joke, which was a good deal enhanced by his appearance. The wine, however, was the most thin, poor, miserable abortion of vinegar that ever I tasted, and after having made every tooth in my head as sharp as a drawn sword by attempting to drink it, I inquired of the capuchin whether any better could be procured within twenty miles for love or money. "'Most assuredly,' answered he, "'for money, though not for love. No one gives anything for love except a young girl of sixteen, or an old woman of seventy. But the truth is, my host tells us always that this is the best wine in the world, till he sees a piece of silver between the fingers of some worthy signor, who desires to treat a poor capuchin to a horn of the best cahors. "'Oh, if that be all,' I answered, "'we will soon have something better,' and I drew a crown piece from my purse. "'Oh, aubergiste!' exclaimed the capuchin, as soon as he saw it. "'A flagon of your best for this sweet youth, and mind, I tell you, "'tis a mortal sin to give bad wine when tis well paid for, "'and a capuchin is to drink it.' I was not at the time of life to estimate very critically every propriety in the demeanour of a companion for half an hour. Man, unlike the insect, begins the being as a butterfly, which he generally ends as a chrysalis. Amusement, or as it should be called, excitement, is everything at nineteen, and the butterfly, though it destroys not like the worm, nor hoards like the bee, still flies to every leaf that meets its sight, if it be but for the sake of the flutter. The capuchin's gaiety amused me, and I saw no deeper into his character. The wine was brought, and having passed once round and proved to all our tastes, the jovial monk set the flagon between himself and me, and enlivened the next half hour with a variety of tales, at the end of each taking a deep draught, and exclaiming, If it be not a true story, may this be the last drop I ever shall drink in my life. At length, with a story far more marvellous than any of the others, the capuchin emptied the flagon, adding his usual asseveration in regard to its truth. "'I don't believe a word of it,' said the man in black. "'And I say it's true,' reiterated the capuchin, laughing till a stag might have jumped down his throat. "'Order another flagon of wine, and I will drink upon it till the death.' "'Nay,' replied the other, "'I will play you for a flagon of the best at Trick-Track, and treat the company. The capuchin readily accepted the defiance. The cards were brought, the window shut, and mine host lighted six large candles in an immense sconce, just behind the capuchin and myself. The thin gentleman with his mustachios was on the other side of the table with old Houssay, who, though an indefatigable old soldier, seemed tired out, and laying his head upon his folded arms, fell asleep. In the meanwhile, the wine made its appearance and passed round, after which the game began, and the poor player in black lost his flagon of wine in the space of five minutes, much to the amusement of the capuchin, who chuckled and drank with much profane glee. The whole scene amused me. I flattered myself I was fond of studying character, and I would have done a great deal to excite the two originals before me to unfold themselves. This they seemed very well inclined to do, without my taking any trouble to bring it about. The thin gentleman got somewhat angry, and claimed his revenge of the capuchin, who beat him again, and chuckled more than ever. The other's rage then burst forth. He attributed his defeat to ill luck, and demanded what the monk meant by laughing, and whether he meant to say he had played ill. "'Aye, truly,' replied the capuchin, "'and so ill that I will answer for it this young gentleman, even if he knows nothing of the game, will beat you for a pistole. And turning round, he asked me if I knew the game, or if I was afraid to play with so skilful an antagonist. I said that I knew very little of it, but that I was willing to play, and took the cards, only intending to sit one game, seeing that my opponent played miserably ill. He lost as before, and still cursing his luck, demanded his revenge, which was worse. Nothing could be more diverting than the fury into which he cast himself, twisting up his mustachios, and wriggling his back into contortions, of which I had not deemed its rigidity capable, while the capuchin chuckled, and looking over my cards, advised me what to do. 
At length my adversary proposed to double, to which I agreed, hoping heartily that he would win, and thus leave us as we had sat down. But fortune was still against him, or rather his bad playing, for he laid his game entirely open, and suffered me to play through it. He lost, and drawing forth a leathern pouch was about to pay me, when the capuchin said that perhaps I would play one more game for the twelve pistoles. The thin gentleman said it would be but generous of me, but, however, he could not demand it if I chose to refuse. So much foolish shame did I feel about taking his money, that, to tell the truth, I was glad to sit down again, and we recommenced each staking twelve pistoles. Fortune had changed, however. The dice favoured him. He played more carefully, and won the game. But by so slight a matter that it showed nothing but extraordinary luck could have made him gain it. It was now my turn to be anxious. I had lost six pistoles out of the money my father had given for my journey to Spain. How could I tell Father Francis, I asked myself, especially when I had lost them in such a manner and in such company? My antagonist, too, had won by such a mere trifle that it made me angry. I therefore resolved to try again, and again I lost. The sum was so considerable I dared not stop, and I claimed my revenge. My adversary was all complacence, and, as before, we doubled our stake. An intolerable thirst had now seized upon me, and pouring out a cup of wine, I set it down beside me while I played. The game went on, and I never suspected false play, though my opponent paused long between each of his cards, but that was natural, as the stake was large, and I fancied that he felt the same palpitating anxiety that I did myself. To conceal this as much as possible, while he pondered, I fixed my eyes upon the cup of wine, in which the lights of the sconce were reflected very brilliantly. Suddenly two of the flames seemed to become obscured, for I lost the reflection in the wine. This surprised me, but I had still sufficient presence of mind to take no notice, and keep my eyes fixed, when presently the lights appeared again. The moment after the same eclipse took place, and, raising my eyes to my opponent's countenance, I perceived that his glance was fixed upon a point immediately above my head. The matter was now clear. My good friend, the capuchin, who was kindly giving me his advice and assistance, seeming all the while most anxious that I should recover my loss, and assuring me that it was a momentary run of ill luck, which must change within five minutes, took care at the same time to communicate to my adversary, by signs above my head, the cards I had in my hand, and what I was likely to play. What was to be done I knew not. To be cheated in so barefaced a manner was unendurable, and yet how to avoid paying what I lost, unless I could prove the fraud, was a question difficult to solve. In this dilemma I resolved to wake my faithful Ousset by touching his foot under the table, at the moment the capuchin was executing his fraud. What was my joy then, when, on glancing towards the ci devant trumpeter, I perceived his eyes twinkling brightly just above his arms, notwithstanding that he pretended to sleep, and I immediately saw that he had, from the first, appreciated the talents of my companions. My resolution was instantly taken, and letting the game proceed to its most anxious point, I saw, in the accidental mirror that the wine afforded me, the signs of the worthy capuchin proceeding with vast celerity, when, starting suddenly up, I caught his wrist, as the hand was in the very act, and held it there with all the vigour of a young and powerful frame, excited to unusual energy by anger and indignation. Houssay was upon his feet in a moment, and catching the collar of the black cavalier, who was beginning to swear some very big oaths, he flung him back upon the ground with little ceremony, at the same time dislodging from the lawn frills which a adorned his wrist a pair of dice that the honest gentleman kept there to meet all occasions for a moment or two the presence of mind which is part of a sharper's profession abandoned our two amiable companions the capuchin especially remaining without motion of any kind his mouth open his eyes staring and his hands up in the air with three fingers extended exactly in the same attitude as he was when i detected his knavery he soon, however, recovered himself, and jerking his hand out of my grasp with a force I knew not he possessed, 
he burst into a fit of laughter very good very good indeed cried he so you have found it out well are you not very much obliged to us for the lesson remember it young man remember it to the last day you have to live for you may chance to fall into the hands of sharpers from whom you may not escape very easily the impudence of the fellow was beyond my patience especially as while he was speaking i had split one of the dice produced from his companion's sleeve and found it loaded with a piece of lead the size of a pea whenever i meet with sharpers said i i shall treat them but one way namely if they do not get out of the room whenever they are found out i shall kick them downstairs from the top to the bottom suppose there are no stairs said the capuchin coolly moving towards the door at the same time then i shall throw them out of the window replied i i weigh two hundred weight answered the monk with the same imperturbable composure good night my young vitol you'll be caught yet though your wings are so free come along count crack he continued to his companion whom i suffered to take up his own money after i repossessed myself of the pistoles which he had won before i had discovered his fraud your game is over for to-night good night fair sirs good night god bless you and keep you from sharpers and leering his small leaden eyes with a look strangely compounded of humour and cunning and even stupidity he rolled out of the room with his companion leaving us to our own reflections when they were gone my worthy attendant and myself stood looking at each other for some moments in silence at length however he began laughing i saw cried he what they were about from the first but i did not think your young wit was sharp as my old knowledge so i pretended to be asleep and lay watching them but you served them a famous trick count louis that you did your father would laugh heartily to hear it hush hush cried i for heaven's sake never mention it to my father or to any one but above all on no account to father francis i then exacted a promise to this effect from the good old soldier feeling heartily ashamed of my night's employment and turning as red as fire every time the thought crossed my mind that i had been sitting drinking and playing with a couple of vulgar sharpers who had nearly succeeded in cheating me of all the money which my father had given me from his own limited means to get rid of these pleasant reflections i hurried to bed and meeting the rotund form of the capuchin on the stairs nearly jostled him to the bottom in pure ill-humour End of chapter 6chapter seven of de lorme by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven early the next morning we arose and took our departure for gavarni mine host at luz however drew me aside as we were setting out and said he hoped we had not suffered ourselves to be cheated by the capuchin or his companion each of whom he was sure was a great rogue and the capuchin he believed had no more of the monk about him than the gown and shaved head be cautious be cautious said he and if ever you meet them again have nothing to do with them i thanked this candid host for his information giving him at the same time to understand that he had better have warned me the night before and that i took his tardy caution at no more than it was worth after which i spurred on and joined father francis and Houssay who had not proceeded far on their journey ere i reached them our road to gavarni lay through scenery of that grand and magnificent nature which mocks the feeble power of language the change was still from sublime to sublime till the heart seemed to wake at its own expansion the vast the wonderful the beautiful the sweet were spread around in dazzling confusion the gigantic rocks and precipices the profuse vegetation the peculiar lustrous atmosphere of the mountains the thousand rare and lovely flowers with which every spot of soil was carpeted and every rock adorned the very butterflies which fluttering about in thousands seemed like flying blossoms all occupied my mind with new and beautiful objects till it was almost wearied with the exhaustless novelty all was lovely and yet i felt then and always do feel 
in such scenes a degree of calm melancholy so undefined in its nature that i know not in what to seek its cause whether it is that man feels all the weaknesses and follies of his passions reproved by the calm grandeur of nature's vaster works or whether his spirit excited by the view of things so beautiful seemed clogged and shackled by the clay to which she is joined and longs to throw off those earthly trammels which circumscribe her powers to enjoy to estimate to comprehend i know not had the scenery through which we pass needed a climax even more sublime than itself it could not have been more exquisitely terminated than by the famous circle of gavarni where above an amphitheatre of black marble fourteen hundred feet in height perpendicular as a wall and sweeping round in extent of half a league rises the icy summit of the pyrenees flashing back the rays of the sun in long beams of many-coloured lights when we arrived in the centre of the amphitheatre a light cloud was stretched across the top of the cascade while the stream shooting over the precipice above us fell with one burst full fourteen hundred feet and before it reached the ground also spread out into another cloud gazing upon it as we did from a distance we saw it thus pouring on between the two without perceiving whence it came or whither it went so that the long defined line of its waters streaming from the one indistinct vapour to the other offered no bad image of the course of mortal time flowing on between two misty eternities at the same time the bright diamond heads of the mountain shone out above the clouds with a grand unearthly lustre like those mighty visions of heaven seen by the inspired apostle at samos i could have gazed on it for ever but the evening light soon began to fail and as we had to rise early also the next morning our stay in the amphitheatre was necessarily curtailed winding round the little lakes that the stream forms after its fall we returned to the filthy hut in which we were to pass the night often looking back by the way to catch another glance of that grand and wonderful scene whose very remembrance makes every other object seem small and insignificant by sunrise we were once more upon our way and passing through what is called the porte de gavarni entered spain after having been examined from top to toe by the officers of the spanish custom house a wide and wavy sea of blue interminable hills now presented themselves and a guide whom we had hired at gavarni pointed out a spot in the distance which he called saragossa had he called it jerusalem he might have done so uncontradicted by any object visible to our eyes for nothing was to be seen but hill beyond hill valley running into valley till the vast distance and the blue sky mingled together with scarcely a perceptible line to mark the division thitherward however we wended on and some hours after reached hucker where out of complaisance to father francis's mule we remained for the night and set off before daybreak the next morning hoping to escape the heat of the middle of the day in this we were deceived making less progress than we anticipated and enjoying the scorching of the meridian sun till we reached the gates of saragossa on arriving at the inn we inquired for the chevalier as we had been directed but found that he had ridden out early in the morning he returned however soon after and having welcomed us cordially to spain as no apartments could be procured in the house he led us out to seek for a lodging in the immediate neighbourhood it was some time before we could discover one to our mind for it is with great difficulty that the spaniards can be induced to receive any foreigner into their dwelling and even when we did so we had to undergo a strict an examination by the old lady of the house as we had bestowed upon her apartments she said it was but just that both parties should be satisfied she with us as well as we with her and not content with asking all manner of questions which had as much to do with her lodgings as with her hopes of heaven she actually turned me round to take a more complete view of my figure this was carrying the ridiculous to so high a point that i burst out into a fit of laughter which far from offending the good dame tickled her own organs of risibility and from that moment we were the best friends in the world
our baggage being brought and it being agreed that we should eat at the posada with the chevalier nothing remained but to distribute the three chambers upon the same floor which constituted our apartments according to our various tastes as father francis sought more quiet than amusement he fixed upon the large room behind where he certainly could be quiet enough for if ever even the distant voice of an amorous cat on the housetop reached his solitude it must have been a far and a faint sound like the hymns of angels said to be heard by monks in the cells of a monastery Houssay took up with the small chamber between the two larger ones and i occupied the front room of a tall house in a narrow street whose extreme width of which might possibly be two ells nevertheless whatever was to be seen was to be seen from my window and my very first determination was to see as much of spain while i was in it as i possibly could at eighteen one has very few doubts and very few fears much passion and much curiosity and for my own part i had resolved if i did not view the spaniard in all situations it should not be my fault in short by the time i arrived at saragossa i was willing to enter into any sort of adventure that might present itself and though the memory of helen might act as some restraint upon me yet i am afraid i wanted that strong moral principle which ought ever to guide us in all our actions i make this acknowledgment because i look upon these sheets to be a sort of confession which in making at all i am bound to write truly and though i shall not dwell upon any of those scenes of vice which might lead others by a mere detail into the very errors that i commemorate be it remembered that i seek not to show myself at any period of my life as better or purer than i was with regard to every feeling that came within the direct code of honour or even its refinements i had imbibed them from my earliest days but i was a countryman of henri quatre and not without a great share of that weakness which in the gallant monarch was redeemed by a thousand great and shining qualities but the love of adventure was my principal failing which is a sort of mental spirit drinking as hard to be overcome as the passion for strong waters itself i know not why or how but the chevalier seemed to have an instinctive perception of my character which almost frightened me and while father francis was seeking in his bags for a parcel which arnaud at lourdes had entrusted to his care my keen-sighted companion drew me to the window of the front chamber and after having by a few brief observations on my disposition shown me that he saw into my bosom even more clearly than i did myself he warned me of many of the dangers of a spanish town remember my dear louis continued he that i only tell you that such things exist i do not tell you to avoid them your own good sense as far as the good sense of a very young man can go will tell you how to act and i am afraid that all men in this world must buy experience for themselves for if an angel from heaven were to vouch its truths they would not believe the experience of others however loving you as i do and you do not know how much i love you there is one thing i must exact if you want advice apply to me if you want assistance apply to me if you want a sword to back your quarrel you must seek none but mine as he spoke father francis entered the room with a look of much consternation and sorrow i hope and trust said he advancing to the chevalier that the packet which your procureur arnaud entrusted to me for you is of no great value for on my honour it has been stolen by some one out of my bags the pale cheek of the chevalier grew a shade paler and though no other emotion was visible the one sign led me to think that the packet was of the utmost import for never before did i see him yield the least symptom of agitation to any event whatever i did expect replied he in a calm unshaken voice some papers of much consequence but i know not whether this packet you mention contained them there is no use my good father francis of distressing yourself upon the subject he added seeing the very great pain which the accident had caused to the worthy old man if by calling to mind the circumstances you can find a probability of its recovery we will immediately take measures to effect it if not the packet is lost and we will forget it 
how it has been abstracted or when answered the good priest i know not on arriving at luce at the end of our first day's journey i opened my valise on purpose to put that package in safety wrapping it up with some small stock of money that i had laid by for the purpose of doing arms but both are gone stolen for the sake of the money said the chevalier shutting his teeth and compressing his lips as if to master the vexation he felt well proceeded he with a sigh it is in vain we struggle against destiny for sixteen years i have been seeking those papers but always by some unfortunate accident they have been thrown out of my reach destiny wills not that i shall have them and i will give it up and what do you mean by destiny my dear son demanded father francis with the anxious haste of an enthusiastic man who fancies he discovers some great error or mistake in a person he esteems many people allow their energies to be benumbed and even their religion by a theory of fatalism which has its foundation in a great mistake it appears to me my good father replied the chevalier with a smile that fate grasps us as it were in a cleft stick as i have seen many a boor catch a viper there we may struggle as much as we like but we are fixed down and cannot escape nay nay said father francis it is denying the goodness of god every one must feel within himself the power of choosing whatever way or whatever conduct he thinks fit a man standing at a spot where two roads separate does he not always feel within himself the power to follow whichever he likes and yet perhaps death lies on the one road and good fortune on the other but if he is destined to die that day that day will he die replied the chevalier and if you allow that god foresees which the traveller will take of course he must take it and his free will is at an end nay my son not so replied the old man what you call foresight is in the deity what memory would be in man if it were perfect it is knowledge standing in the midst of eternity all is present to the eye of god and he knows what man will do as well as what man has done but that does not imply that man has not the liberty of choice for it is his very own choice that conducts him to the results which god already knows when a lizard runs away frightened from before your footsteps you may know positively that it will fly to its hole but your knowledge does not affect its purpose nor would it if your knowledge was as certain as omniscience if you ask me why if man's choice will be bad the omnipotent does not will it to be good i say it is to leave him that very freedom of choice which you deny father if there were no evil in the world morally or physically and it would be easy to show that one cannot exist without the other what would the world be there would be no virtue because there could be no possibility of vice there would be no passions because there would be nothing to excite them there would be no wishes because privation being an ill no desire for anything could possibly exist there could be no motion for the movement of one thing would displace another which was in its proper place before there would be no action for there being neither passions nor wishes nothing would prompt action in short the argument might be carried on to show that the universe would not be and that the whole would be god alone no one will deny that the least imperfection is in itself evil and that without god created what was equal to himself which implies as far as the act of creation goes a mathematical impossibility whatever he created must have been subject to imperfection and consequently would admit of evil evil once admitted all the rest follows and if any one dare to ask why then god created at all let him look round on the splendid universe the thousand magnificent effects of divine love of divine bounty and of divine power and feel himself rebuked for thinking that such attributes could slumber unexerted but said the chevalier it appears to me that your argument militates against the first principle of our religion the divinity of christ for you say it implies an impossibility that god should create what was equal to himself christ was not created replied the priest 
and laying his hand on his breast he bowed his head reverently repeating the words of scripture this is my only begotten son in whom i am well pleased whether the chevalier retained his own opinions or not i cannot tell but most probably he did for certain it is that nothing is more difficult to find in any man than the faculty of being convinced however he dropped the subject and never more to my knowledge resumed it father francis whose whole heart was mildness and humility began to fancy after a few minutes that he had been guilty of some presumption in arguing so boldly on the secrets of providence god forgive me said he if i have done irreverently in seeking as far as my poor intellect could go to demonstrate by simple reasoning that which we ought to receive as a matter of faith but often in my more solitary hours in thinking over these subjects i would find a degree of obscurity and confusion in my own ideas which impelled me to endeavour to clear and to arrange them i am convinced you did very right my good father replied the chevalier and that one great object in the good regulations of one's mind is to obtain fixed principles on every subject which comes under our review carrying to the examination an ardent desire for truth and to religious inquiries that profound reverence and humble diffidence of human reason that so deep and so important a subject imperatively requires here dropped the conversation leaving both parties better satisfied with each other than usually happens after any discussion but more especially where religion is at all involved End of chapter seven chapter eight of de Lorme by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight my first care after finding myself completely settled at saragossa was to overcome the difficulties of the spanish language i had studied it superficially long before and thanks to my bayonet's tongue i now accomplished the hardest part of the undertaking namely the pronunciation which is very rarely acquired by frenchmen in general by the time this was gained i had been three months in spain living in a state of high ease and tranquillity very much against my will finding nothing to excite or to romance upon and at best meeting with but those little adventures which are unworthy if not unfit for detail it was not however my fault i went continually to the teatro to the plaza de toros and to all those places where one may most easily get oneself into mischief without accomplishing my object going from one to the other with the most provoking quiet uninterrupted facility that fortune could furnish forth to annoy me withal every one was calm polite and cold no one fell in love with me no one quarrelled with me no one took any notice of me and i was beginning to think the spaniards the most stupid sober mole-like race that the world contained when some circumstances occurred which from the very first excited my curiosity if they did not reach any more violent passion i have said that the room which i had chosen looked into the street wherein we lodged and also that that street was very narrow at first i had hoped to draw something from this circumstance having always entertained high ideas of the pleasures and agitations of making love across a street and for the whole first night after our arrival i amused myself with fancying some very beautiful lady with some very horrible guardian who would find means of conversing with me from the jalousies on the other side i was soon undeceived a very little knowledge of the locality showing me that the windows opposite to my own were placed in the back of a row of houses forming one side of the principal street to which our own was parallel and i had reason to believe that none but servants and inferior persons in general dwelt in those rooms the windows of which might communicate with mine this was a disappointment and i thought no more of it till one evening when i had been riding in the environs with the chevalier de montenero who in general gave me about an hour of his society every day the rest of his time was principally spent i understood in reading and writing and in bringing to a conclusion some affairs of importance 
which had accumulated during a long absence in the new world where my talkative landlady assured me he had won high honours both as a statesman and a warrior on the day which i speak of however we had been absent nearly three hours and returning somewhat heated i threw myself down before the open window with a book in my hand how i happened to raise my eyes to the opposite houses i know not but doing so i saw the fingers of a hand so fair that it could belong to no servant resting on the bars of the jalousie while at the same time a very bright pair of eyes glittered through the aperture apparently rather turned down the street as if watching for the coming of some one my own jalousie was drawn for the sake of the shade so that i could observe without being remarked and approaching the window in a few minutes after i saw a priest enter at a small door just below the window where the eyes were watching i concluded that this was the father confessor and i took care to see him depart after which i partly opened my blind and remarked behind the one opposite the same eyes i had before seen but now evidently turned towards myself and i determined not to lose for lack of boldness whatever good fortune should fall in my way love of course was out of the question for i certainly loved helen now as deeply as ever and having no excuse i shall not seek one nor even try to palliate my fault the only incentives i had were idleness youth and a passion for adventure but these were quite sufficient to carry me headlong on upon the first mad scheme that opened to my view every one i believe feels or must have felt sensations somewhat similar when the heart's wild spirit seems rioting to be free and hurrying on reason and thought and virtue tumultuous along the mad course of passion till each is trodden down in turn beneath the feet of the follies that come after what i sought i hardly know it was not vice it was adventure from that day forward i was more frequently at my window than anywhere else and i cannot say that the fair object of my watching seemed after a time to find the proximity of her own blind the most disagreeable part of her apartment indeed the weather was so warm and so oppressive that on more than one occasion she partially opened her jalousie to admit a freer current of air giving me at the same time an opportunity of beholding one of the loveliest faces and forms i ever beheld though so shadowed by the semi-darkness of the room as to throw over the whole a mysterious air of dimness doubly exciting of course the matter paused not there i had heard and read a thousand tales of such encounters i was as deeply read in all romances of love as the knight of la mancha was in those of chivalry and i had recourse to the only means in my power of commencing a communication with my fair neighbour namely by signs at first she withdrew as if indignant then endured them then laughed at them and in the end somewhat suddenly and abruptly seemed to return them though so slightly that all my ingenuity would not serve me to comprehend what she sought to express i had heard that the ladies of spain were so skilful in finding the means of carrying on these mute conversations that many a tender tale had been told in silently playing with a fan and i somewhat wondered to find even one spanish girl so ignorant of the language of signs she had evidently however endeavoured to return an answer to mine and that was enough to make my heart beat high as soon as night followed upon the day which had beheld this gracious and favourable change i returned to my station at the window the jalousies were closed and no sign or symptom announced that any one was within for near half an hour when suddenly i heard them move and beheld them slowly and cautiously open to perhaps the extent of three inches i could see nothing but that they were open though i strained my eyes to discover what was beyond however after a moment's silence i had my recompense by hearing a very soft and musical voice demand in a low tone are you there i am answered i in the hyperbolic style usual to spanish gallants i am fairest of earth's creatures and ready to serve you with life and hush said the voice 
go instantly to the theatre and ask for the box marked G. Wait there, whatever betide, and say no more. The jalousie immediately closed, and snatching up my hat, I prepared to obey the command, when my door opened and Father Francis appeared with a light. "'In the dark, my dear Louis,' he said with some astonishment. "'What are you doing in the dark? Better come and read Seneca with me.' "'I am just going to the play,' replied I, holding up my hand to my eyes as if the sudden light affected them, but in reality to cover a certain crimsoning of the cheek which the mere presence of so good and pure a being called up, in spite of my efforts to prevent it. "'They play to-night Calderon's Cisma de Inglaterra. "'You are all too fond of that bad place, a theatre,' said Father Francis. "'But I suppose, Louis, that it will always be so at your age. "'I must not forget now, when I can no longer enjoy, "'that you are in the season of enjoyment, and that I was once like you. "'However, I hope that your love of theatres will soon pass. "'They were instituted, doubtless, to promote morality and to do good.' but they are sadly perverted in our day. Well, God be with you. I could have well spared the interruption, but more especially the good father's recommendation to God, when my purpose was not what my own heart could fully approve. Not that I had any formed design of evil, not that I had any wish of wrongdoing innocence, nay, nor of breaking my faith to Helen. Twas but excitement, I thought, and though perhaps I wished I had not advanced so far, I was ashamed of drawing back, and I hurried on to the theatre. A great crowd was going in, and following the course of the stream I sought for the box marked G. On finding it I was surprised to discover that it was one of the curtained boxes reserved for the principal officers of the city. An old woman had the keys of these boxes in charge, and to her I applied for admission. The face of surprise which she assumed I shall not easily forget. Hey day, she exclaimed, let you into the box of the corregidor? I dare say. Pray, young sir, where is your order? Here, said I, nothing abashed, and resolved to accomplish my object. And putting my hand in my pocket, I seemed to search for the order, till some persons who were near had passed on. I then produced a pistol, which the old lady found to be in order in so good and authentic a form, that she drew forth the key and proceeded towards the door, saying, "'The corregidor went out of town this morning, and will not return for two days, so there can be no great harm in letting you in. But keep the curtains closed. You can see and hear very well through the chinks, without showing yourself in the corregidor's box, I warrant.' I promised to observe her directions, and entered the box, which was empty. I seated myself behind the curtains, which, drawn completely across the front, hid me from the spectators, though I had still a good view of the stage. The play, indeed, was not what I came to see, and at first I listened with eager and attentive ears to the sound of every foot that passed by the door of the box. Actually trembling with anxiety and excitement, I could hear one person after another go by, till the tide of spectators began to slacken, and, at last, but the solitary step of some late straggler sounded along the passage, hurrying on to make up for his delay. Two or three times when the foot was lighter than the rest, or when it seemed to pause near the door, I started up, and my heart beat till it was actually painful to feel it throbbing against my side. But after a while, in order to calm such sensations, I endeavoured to fix my mind upon the play, and won by the cunning of the scene, I gradually entered into the passions I saw portrayed. The play, La Cisma de Inglaterra, contained all of Calderon's rigour and wit, and also all his extravagance. The first scene, representing the dream of Henry the Eighth, King of England, and his reception of the two letters from the Pope, and from Martin Luther, was too full of petty conceits to engage me for a moment. But the description of Anne Bullen as given by Carlos in the second scene, caught my young imagination, and the exquisite wit of the court fool, Pasquin, soon riveted my attention. The character had been allotted to one of the best performance of the company, and it was wonderful what point he gave to the least word of the jester. 
Calderon had done much, but every theatrical writer must leave much for the player, and in this instance nothing he could have wished expressed was either omitted or caricatured. It was all true and simple, from the broad childish stare, half folly, half satire, with which he exclaimed, Que soy galan de galanes, to the face of moralizing meditation, half bewildered, half severe, with which he commented on the king's melancholy. Triste este rey, de que sirve, cuanto puede, cuanto manda, si no puede estar alegre, cuando quiere. The play had proceeded for some time, and I was listening with deep interest to the exquisite dialogue between the king and Anne Bullen, in which he first discovers his passion to her. When the door of the box opened and a lady entered, wrapped in a black mantilla, her face was also concealed with a black velvet mask, and though, after shutting the door of the box carefully, she dropped the mantilla, discovering a form on whose beauties I will not dwell. She still retained the mask for some moments, and I could see her hand shake as it leaned on the back of one of the seats. My heart beat so violently that I could scarcely speak, and I would have given worlds for one word from her lips, to which I might have replied. Time, however, was not to be lost, and advancing, I offered my hand to lead her forward, but she raised her finger, saying in a very low voice, "'Hush! Is there anyone in the box to the left?' "'I have heard no one,' replied I, rejoicing to recognise the same tones in which the appointment had been made with me. "'Nay, do not tremble so,' I added, laying my hand on hers, and I believe the agitation which that touch must have told her I experienced myself served more to reassure her than my words. "'Why should you fear with a friend, a lover, an adorer? Why, too, should you hide your face from one to whom its lightest look is joy?' Will you not take off your mask? The lady made no reply, but seating herself in the back part of the box, leaned her head for some time upon her hand, over which the ringlets of her rich black hair fell in glossy profusion. My agitation gradually subsided. I added caresses to tender language. I held her hand in mine. I ventured to carry it to my lips and I am afraid many a burning word did passion suggest to my tongue. For a moment or two she let me retain her hand, seeming totally absorbed by feelings which gave no other sense power to act, but at length she gently withdrew it from mine, and untying a string that passed through her hair, let the mask drop from her face. If her figure had struck me as lovely, how transcendentally beautiful did her face appear, when that which hid it was thus suddenly removed. She could not be more than eighteen, and each clear, exquisite feature seemed moulded after the enchanting specimens of ancient art, but animated with that living grace which leaves the statue far below. Her lip was all sweetness, and her brow all bland expanse, but there was a wild, energetic fire in her eye which spoke of the strong and ardent passions of her country and there was also an occasional gleam in it that had something almost approaching the intensity of mental wandering. Let me not say that those eyes were anything less than beautiful. They were of those full, dark, thrilling orbs that seem to look deep into the heart of man and exercise upon all its pulses a strange, attracting influence, like that which the bright moons hold over the waters of the world, and round them swept a long, black, silky fringe that shaded and softened without diminishing their lustre by a ray. As soon as she recovered herself sufficiently to speak, she replied to my ardent professions in language which, though somewhat wild and undefined, left me no doubt of her feelings. She told me, too, that she was the daughter of the Corregidor, and that her mother was dead, and that her father loved her even to idolatry, that she returned his affection, and that never, even were it to wed a monarch, would she leave him. At the same time she spoke enthusiastically, even wildly, of love and passion, and to what it might prompt a determined heart. She spoke, too, of jealousy, but she said it was incompatible with love, for that a mind which felt like hers was instantly convert its love into hate, if it once found itself deceived, 
and what was there she asked that such hate would not do on this subject she threw out some dark and mysterious hints which at any other moment might have made me estimate the dangerous excess of all her passions but i was infatuated and would not see the perils that surrounded the dim gulf into which i was plunging we talked long and we talked ardently and in the end when some little time before the play was concluded she rose to leave me my brain was in a whirl that wanted little but the name to be madness though i have unlimited power over my actions said she even perhaps too much so for ungrateful that i am i sometimes wish my father loved me less or more wisely but as i said though i have unlimited power over my own actions some reasons forbade me to-night receiving you in my own house to-morrow night you may come you have remarked she added putting on her mask and wrapping her mantilla round her a small door under the window of my dressing-room at midnight it will be open come thither for there are many things i wish to say then she enjoined me not to leave the theatre till the play was completely over and left me my whole mind and thoughts in a state of agitation and confusion hardly to be expressed i will not say that conscience did not somewhat whisper i was doing wrong but the tumult of excited passion and the gratification of my spirit of romance prevented me even from calculating how far i might be hurried there was certainly some vague point where i proposed to stop short of vice and i trust i should have done so even had not other circumstances intervened to save me therefrom however that may be let it be marked and remembered from the first that the steps i took in wrong by an extraordinary chain of circumstances caused all the misery of my existence End of chapter eight Chapter nine of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nine. Never, perhaps, in my existence, an existence varied by dangers, by difficulties, by passions, and by follies, never did any day seem to drag so heavily towards its conclusion as that which lay between me and the meeting appointed for the following night. It was not alone that impatient expectation which lengthens time till moments seem eternities, but it was, added to this, that I had to find occupation for every moment, lest tardy regrets should interpose, and mingle bitter with what was ever a sweet cup to me, excitement. Verily do I believe that I crowded into that one day more employments than many men bestow upon a year. I rode through the whole town, I witnessed the bull-fight, I wrote a letter to my father, God knows what it contained, for I know not, and I never knew. I read Plato, which was like pouring cold water on a burning furnace. I played on my guitar, I sung to it, I solved a problem of Euclid. I read a page of Descartes, and thousands of other things did I do, to fill up the horrid vacancy of each long expectant minute. At length, however, day waned night came and the hour approached nearer and more near at ten o'clock i pretended fatigue and leaving father francis who seemed well inclined to consume the midnight oil i retired to my own apartment as if to bed old Houssay came to assist me but i made an excuse to send him away which though perhaps a lame one he was too old a soldier not to take at once he was a man that never asked any questions whatever the order was he obeyed it instantly and he was unrivalled at the quick conception of a hint thus i had scarcely finished my first sentence explanatory of my reasons for not requiring his services than running on at once to the conclusion he made his bow and quitted the room being left alone two more long hours did i wear out in the fever of expectation all noises gradually subsided in the town and in the house and everybody was evidently at repose before half-past eleven this was now the longest half-hour of all i thought the church clock must have gone wrong and have stopped and i was confirmed in this idea when i heard the midnight round of the patrol of the holy brotherhood pass by the house 
as usual pushing at every door to see that they were closed for the night. Shortly after, however, the chimes of midnight began, and, with a beating heart, I descended the stairs, having previously ensured the means of opening the door without noise. In a moment after, the fresh night air blew chill upon my cheek, and conveyed a sort of shudder to my heart, which I could scarce help feeling as a sinister omen. But closing the door as near as I could, without shutting it entirely, I darted across the street, pushed open the little door, and entered. As I did so, the garments of a woman rustled against me, and I caught the same fair soft hand I had held the former night. It burned like a living fire, and as I held it in mine, it did not return or even seem sensible to the pressure, but my fingers felt almost scorched with the feverish heat of hers. Cautiously shutting the door, she led me by the hand up a flight of stairs to a small, elegant dressing-room, wherein, on the toilet-table, was a burning lamp. It shone dimly, but with sufficient light to show me that my fair companion, though lovely as ever, was deadly pale, and attributing it to that agitation which she could not but feel a thousand times more than even I did, I attempted to compose her by a multitude of caresses and vows, which she suffered me to lavish upon her almost unnoticed, remaining with a mute tongue and wandering eye, as if my words scarcely found their way to the seat of intellect. At length, laying her hand upon the hilt of my sword, with a faint smile, she said, "'What, a sword? You should never come to see a lady with a sword.' And, unbuckling it with her own hand, she laid it on the table. "'Now,' proceeded she, taking up the lamp and leading the way into a splendid room beyond, "'now you must give me a proof of your love.' And she shut the door suddenly behind us with a quickness which almost made me start. Her whole conduct, her whole appearance was strange. That a girl of such high station should appear agitated at receiving in secret the first visit of one whom she had every right to look upon as a lover was not surprising, but her eye wandered with a fearful sort of wildness, and her cheek was so deadly, deadly pale that I scarcely ever thought to see such a hue in anything living. At the same time, the hand with which she held one of mine, as she led me on, confirmed its grasp with a tighter and a tighter clasp, till every slender burning finger seemed impressing itself on my flesh. "'Have you a firm heart?' asked she at length, fixing her eyes upon me, and compressing her full, beautiful lips, as if to master her own sensations. I answered that I had, and, indeed, as the agitation of passion gave way to other feelings, called forth by her singular manner and behaviour, the natural unblenching courage of my race returned to my aid, and I was no longer the tremblingly impassioned boy that entered her house. "'It is well,' said she. "'Come hither, then,' and she led me towards what seemed a heap of cushions covered with a large sheet of linen. For a moment she paused before them, with her foot advanced, as if about to make another step forward, and her eye straining upon the motionless pile before her, as if it were some very horrible object. Then, suddenly taking the edge of the cloth, she threw it back at once, discovering the dead body of a priest weltering in its gore. He seemed to have been a man of about thirty, both by his form and face, which was full, and unmarked by any lines of age. It was turned towards me, and had been slightly convulsed by the pang of death. But still, even in the cold, meaningless features, I thought I could perceive that look of a habitually dissolute mind, which stamps itself in ineffaceable characters. And there was a dark, determined scowl still upon the brow of death, which, to my fancy, spoke of the remorseless violation of the most sacred duties. The limbs were contracted, and one of the hands clenched, as if there had been a momentary struggle before he was mastered to his fate, while the other hand was stretched out with all the fingers wide extended, as while still striving to draw the last few agonizing breaths. His gown was gashed on the left side and dripping with gore, and it is probable that the wound is covered went directly to his heart, from the great effusion of blood that had taken place. It was a dreadful sight, 
and after looking on it for a few moments in astonishment and horror i turned my aching eyes towards the lovely girl that had conducted me to such a strange and awful exhibition she too was gazing at it with that sort of fixed intensity of look which told me that her mind gathered there materials for strong and all-absorbing thoughts in the name of heaven cried i who has done this i answered she with a strange degree of calmness i did it and what on earth could tempt you i continued to so bloody and horrible a crime you shall hear she replied that man was my confessor he took advantage of his power over my mind he won me to all that he wished and then he turned to another fairer perhaps and equally weak i discovered his treachery but i needed it the less as i had seen you and for the first time knew what love was but i warned him never to approach me again if he would escape that spanish revenge whose power he ought to have known he came this very night perhaps from the arms of another and yet he dared to talk to me of passion and of love thinking me still weak enough to yield to him oh with what patience i was endued not to slay him then i bade him go forth and never to approach me again he became enraged he threatened to betray me to publish my name and he is what he is there was a dreadful pause she had worked herself up by the details to a pitch of almost frenzied rage and gazing upon the body of him that had wronged her with a flushed cheek and flashing eyes she seemed as if she would have smote him again the story is told cried she at length and now if you love me as you have said you must carry him forth and cast him into the great foss of the city ha you will not you hate me you despise me then i must speak another language you shall yes you shall or both you and i will join him in the grave and drawing a poniard from her bosom she placed herself between me and the door and do you think me so great a coward replied i hastily to be frightened into doing what i disapprove by a poniard in the hand of a woman no lady no i continued more kindly believing her as i did to be disordered in mind by the intensity of her feelings i pity you from my heart i pity you for the base injuries you have suffered and even though i cannot but condemn the crime you have committed i would do so much very much to soothe to calm to heal your wounded spirit but i spoke long gently kindly to her it reached her heart it touched the better feelings of what might have been a fine though exquisitely sensitive mind and throwing away the poniard she cast herself at my feet where clasping my knees she wept till her agony of tears became perfectly fearful i did everything i could to tranquillize her i entreated i persuaded i reasoned i even caressed there was something so lovely yet so terrible in it all her face her form her agitation the sweetness of her voice the despairing heart-broken expression of her eyes that in spite of her crime i raised her from my feet i held her in my arms and i promised to do all that she would have me after a time she began to recover herself and gently disengaging herself from me she gazed at me with a look of calm powerful painful regret that i never can forget count louis she said you must abhor me and you have alas learned to do so at a moment when i have learned to love you the more your kindness has made me weep it was what i needed it has cleared a cloud from my brain and i now find how very very guilty i am do not take me to your arms i am unworthy they should touch me but fly from me and from this place of horror as speedily as you can for i will not take advantage of the generous offer you make to do that which i so ungenerously asked i asked it in madness for i feel that within the last few hours my reason has not been with me it slept i have now wept and it is awake to all the misery i have brought upon myself go go leave me i will stay and meet the fate my crime deserves but oh i cannot bear to think upon the dishonour and misery of my father's old age 
and again she wept as bitterly as before. Again I applied myself to soothe her, and imprudently certainly, perhaps wrongly, insisted upon carrying away the evidence of her guilt, and disposing of it as she had first demanded. But two short streets lay between the spot where we were and the old boundary of the city, over which it was easy to cast the body into the water below. At that hour I was not likely to meet with any one, as all the sober inhabitants of the town were by this time in their first sleep, and the guard had made its round some time before. I told her all this, and expressed my determination not to leave her in such dreadful circumstances, so that, seeing me resolved upon doing what I had proposed, the natural horror of death and shame overcame her first regret at the thought of implicating me, and she acquiesced. As I approached the body for the purpose of taking it in my arms, I will own, a repulsive feeling of horror gathered about my heart, and a slight shudder passed over me. She saw it, and casting her beautiful arms round my neck, held me back, with a melancholy shake of the head, saying, No, no, no. But I again expressed myself determined, and suddenly pressing her burning lips to mine, she let me go. Pardon me, said she. It is the last I shall ever have, most generous of human beings. And turning away, she kneeled by her bedside, hiding her face upon the clothes, while I raised the body of the priest in my arms and bore it downstairs. Being fortunately of a very strong and vigorous mould, and well hardened by athletic exercises, I could carry a very great weight, but never did I know till then how much more ponderous and unwieldy a dead body is than a living one. I, however, gained the street with my burden, and, with a beating heart and anxious glaring eye, proceeded as fast as I could towards the walls. Everything I saw caused me anxiety and alarm. The small fountain in the corner of the Calle de Sol made me start and almost drop the body, and each shadow that the moon cast across the street cost me many a painful throb. At length, however, I reached the old rampart, where it looks out over the olive grounds, and advancing hurriedly forward, I gave a glance around to see that no one was there, and cast the corpse down into the fosse, which was full of water. I heard the plunge of the body and the rush of the agitated waters, and a shudder passed over me, to think of thus consigning the frail tabernacle that not long since had enshrined a sinful but immortal spirit, to a dark and nameless grave. All the weaknesses of our nature cling to the rites of sepulture, and at any time I should have felt, in so dismissing a dead body to unmourned oblivion, that I was violating the most sacred prejudices of our nature, but when I thought upon the how and the wherefore, my blood felt chill, and I dared not look back to see the full completions of that night's dreadful deeds. My heart was lightened, however, that it was now done, and I turned to proceed home, having had enough of adventure to serve me for a long while. Before I went, I gave an anxious glance around to see whether anyone was watching me, but all seemed void and lonely. I then darted away as fast as I could, still concealing myself in the shadowy sides of the streets, and following a thousand turnings and windings to ensure that my path was not tracked. At length, approaching the street where I lived, I looked round carefully on all sides, and seeing no one, darted up it, sprang forward, and pushed open the door of my lodging. At that moment a figure passed me coming the other way. It was the Chevalier de Montenero, and though he evidently saw me, he went on without remark. I closed the door carefully, groped my way up to my own chamber, and, striking a light, examined my doublet to see if it had received any stains from the gory burden I had carried. In spite of every precaution I had taken, it was wet with blood in three places, and I had much trouble in washing out the marks, though it was itself of murray-coloured cloth somewhat similar in hue. Difficult it is to tell my feelings while engaged in this employment. The horror, the disgust, at each new stain I discovered, mingled with the painful anxiety to efface every trace which the blood of my fellow-being had left. Then, to dispose of the water, whose sanguine colour kept glaring at me whenever I turned, as if I could see nothing but it, became the question, and I was obliged to open the casement and pour it gently over the window-sill, 
without unclosing the jalousies so as to permit its trickling down the front of the house where i knew it must be evaporated before the next morning this took me some time as i did it by but very cautious degrees but then when it was done all vestiges of the deed in which i had been engaged were effaced and to my satisfaction i discovered on examining every part of my apparel with the most painful minuteness that all was free and clear extinguishing my light i now undressed and went to bed but of course not to sleep for hours and hours the scenes in which i had that night taken part floated upon the blank darkness before my eyes and filled me with horrible imaginations a thousand times did i attempt to banish them and give myself up to slumber and a thousand times did they return in new and more horrible shapes till the faint light of the morning began to shine through the openings of the blinds when i fell into a disturbed and feverish sleep it was no relief it was no oblivion the same dreadful scenes returned with all their original force heightened and rendered still more terrific by a thousand wild accessories that uncontrolled fancy brought forward to support them all was horror and despair and i again woke haggard and worn out as the matin bell was sounding from the neighbouring convent i tried it once more and at length succeeded in obtaining a temporary forgetfulness End of chapter 9chapter ten of de lorme by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten i was still in a most profound sleep when i was woke by some one shaking me rudely in the arm and starting up i found my chamber full of the officers of justice by my side stood an alguacil and at my table a sort of escribano was already taking a precise account of the state of the apartment while in conjunction with him various members of the holy brotherhood were examining without ceremony every article of my apparel for a moment or two the surprise mingled with the consciousness of what might be laid to my charge confounded and bewildered me and i gazed about upon all that was taking place with the stupid stare of one still half asleep i soon however recovered myself and hurriedly determined in my own mind the line of conduct that it was necessary to pursue both for the purpose of saving myself and shielding the unfortunate girl of whose crime i doubted not that i should be accused the alguacil was proceeding with a face in which he had concentrated all the strained beams of transmitted authority to question me in a very high tone respecting my occupations of the foregoing night when i cut him short by demanding what he and his myrmidons did in my apartment and warning him that if he expected to extort money from me by such a display he was labouring in vain the worthy officer expressed himself as much offended at this insinuation as if it had been true and informed me that he had come to arrest me on the charge of having the night before murdered in cold blood one father Acevedo and cast him into the fosse below the old wall he farther added that a messenger had been sent for the corregidor who was at a small town not far off and that he was expected in an hour well then replied i boldly wake me when he comes and make as little noise as possible at present and i turned round on my other side as if to address myself to sleep my real purpose however was twofold to gain time for thought and to avoid all questions from the alguacil till i had learned upon what grounds i was accused but in this i was defeated by father francis who interfered with the best intentions in the world and advancing addressed me in french whereupon the alguacil instantly stopped him declaring he would not have any conversation in a foreign tongue you say cried i turning to the old soldier and pointing to the alguacil while i spoke out in spanish if that fellow meddles any more kick him downstairs and now my good father what were you about to say this conduct impudent as it was i well knew was the only thing that could save me from being questioned and cross-examined by the inferior officers before the arrival of the corregidor if i answered i might embarrass myself 
in my after defence and if i refused to answer my contumacy would be construed into guilt all that remained therefore was to treat the alguacils with the degree of scorn which would check their interrogation in its very commencement and which was in some degree justified by the well-known corruption and mercenary character of the inferior officers of the spanish police this proceeding seemed to have the full effect which i intended for the pompous official not only ceased his questions but at the hint of being kicked suffered father francis to go on judging very wisely that however justice might afterwards avenge him his posteriors would at all events suffer in the meantime my dear louis said the good priest you had better rise and clear yourself from the accusation of these men every one in this house knows your innocence and here is an officer of the real hacienda without who swears that he saw the murderer enter this house and we have all suffered ourselves to be examined previous to your having been disturbed rise then and when you have dressed yourself permit him to see that you are not the person and probably by answering the questions of these people you may save yourself from being dragged before the corregidor like a culprit i replied with the same bold tone which i had at first assumed and still speaking aloud in spanish in regard to answering any questions put to me by these knaves who are but as the skirts of the robe of office i shall certainly not demean myself so far but to whatever the corregidor chooses to demand i will reply instantly for i am sure that he will not countenance a plot of this kind which beyond all doubt has been contrived to extort money from a stranger i will rise however as you seem to wish it and then all the world may look at me as long as they will i accordingly rose and dressed myself putting on though i own it was not without much reluctance the same murray-coloured suit i had worn the night before as soon as i was dressed the officer of the real hacienda was called in and immediately pointed me out saying that is the man in so positive a tone that it required all the resolution i possessed to demand with a contemptuous smile pray sir how much is it you expect to extort from me by averring such a notorious falsehood take notice if it be above half a real you shall not have it if you were to give me all that you possess young gentleman answered the man calmly and civilly i would still aver the same thing that you are the man who cast the dead body of father acevedo into the fosse last night while i was on duty seeing that no contraband things were brought into the city i tracked you through the streets till you entered this house and i took good care to remark your person so as to identify it anywhere the man was so clear in his statement and i knew it to be so true that the blood mounted up into my face in spite of every effort i could make to maintain my air of scornful indignation ha ha you colour said the alguacil what do you say to that my young don i say replied i turning upon him fiercely that this man's story has been well contrived and that he tells it coolly but depend on it my good friend when i have cleared myself of this my resemblance and thanks shall light upon your shoulders in the most tangible form i can discover but now take me to the corregidor only while i am gone let some honest person stay and watch these gentry who are fingering my apparel or they will save senor escribano the trouble of making a very long catalogue a crowd of persons were round the door gossiping with an alguacil who had been left there as a sort of guard and the moment i was brought out the noise they were making very much increased with the vociferous delight which all vulgar minds experience on beholding criminals it is a strange devilish propensity that in human nature the child loves to torture the fly or the worm the serf runs to see the victim struggling at the gallows or writhing on the wheel and it is in the child and the vulgar that human nature shines out in its original metal unsilvered over by the false hue of education those who have best defended man attribute his passion for scenes of blood and horror to the renewed feeling which he thence derives from his own security and is there then no way of showing him not cruel but by proving him base 
Must he ever be vilely selfish if he is not savagely brutal? The populace roared as I came forth, with such a shout as we may suppose those refined tigers, the Romans, bestowed on the devoted gladiator when he entered the arena. I felt certain the sounds must reach another person, to whose bosom they would convey greater pangs than even to mine, and though I could not pause to observe anything minutely, as I was hurried on, I glanced my eye up towards the window on the other side of the way, and I am sure I saw a female hand rest on one of the bars of the jalousie. Scarcely two minutes were occupied in bringing me round to the great entrance of the corregidor's house, and finding that he had not arrived, the alguacils made me sit down in a large hall, keeping every one else out, even Father Francis and Ousay, and enjoying my society uninterrupted by the presence of any one but the servants of the corregidor. Whether it was done on purpose or not I cannot say, but first one dropped away, and then another, till I was left alone with the chief alguacil, who, the moment they were all gone, addressed me with a meaning sort of smile. "'Now, young sir,' said he, "'what would you give to get off?' Doubtless, as many bargains are made in halls of justice as on the exchange, and I was even then very well aware that such is the case, but I knew not whether, if my offers did not equal the incorruptible officer's expectation, my words might not be made use of against myself, and therefore I simply replied, "'Nothing!' At the same time, I cannot deny that I would willingly have given my whole inheritance to have been safe on the other side of the Pyrenees. No long time was allowed for deliberation, for a moment after the corregidor arrived, and, as if by magic, I found myself instantly surrounded by all the alguacils and servants who had before disappeared. The magistrate did not pass through the hall wherein I was detained, but after a few minutes, probably spent by him in receiving an account of the whole transaction, an officer approached and led me to a small audience room in which he was seated. Before him was a table with a clerk, and behind him two doors leading to the domestic parts of his dwelling. He appeared to me about sixty, and was as noble a looking man as I had ever beheld. In his face I could trace all his daughter's features, raised and strengthened into the perfection of masculine beauty and though his hair was as white as snow and time had laid a long wrinkle or two across the broad expanse of his forehead yet age in other respects had dealt mildly with him and left the fine arch of his lip unbroken nor stolen one ray of light from his clear intellectual eye as i approached the table at which he was seated he gazed at me with a steady but yet a feeling glance and pointed to a seat i am sorry sir he said that one so young so noble in appearance and especially a stranger to this country should be accused before me of a great and dreadful crime by an officer who having in all relations of life conducted himself well leaves no reason to suppose he acts on culpable motives the duty of my office is a strict one and whatever prepossession I may feel in your favour, all I can do is to receive the accuser's evidence before you, and then, if no evident falsehood appears in his testimony, to order your detention till the case can be examined at large, and judged according to its merits. In the calm dignity of his manner, and the mild firmness of his tone, there was something far more appalling to my mind, knowing well as I did the truth of the charge against me, than any menaces could have been. I felt no inclination, and indeed no power, to treat the accusation with that scorn and indignation which I had formerly affected, but advancing towards the table at which the corregidor was seated, I replied as calmly as I could, You seem, sir, well inclined to do me justice, and I must consequently leave my fate in your hands, but before you commit me to a prison, which is in itself a punishment, and consequently an act of injustice to an innocent man, permit me to make one or two observations in my own defence. Certainly, replied the corregidor, I hold myself bound to attend to every reasonable argument you can adduce, although I am afraid my duty will not permit me to interpose between an accused person and the regular course of investigation. But proceed. In the first place, then, I replied, 
I have to protest my innocence of the blood which is laid to my charge, in the most solemn manner, on my honour as a gentleman, on my faith as a Christian. In the next place, I have to ask whether there exists the least probability that I should murder in cold blood a stranger with whom I had no acquaintance, for I defy any one to show that I knew one single priest in this city, or was ever seen to speak to one. In addition to this, which makes my guilt highly improbable, let me beg you to examine my preceptor, my valet, and the proprietors of the house in which I lodge. I am afraid that will be impossible at this stage of the business, replied the magistrate, without some glaring discrepancy appears in the accuser's testimony, but let him be called in. Hitherto the audience chamber had been occupied alone by the corregidor, his secretary, two alguacils, and myself, but the moment afterwards the doors were opened, and a rush of people took place from without, filling up the space behind me. The presence of the multitude made my heart beat, I confess, and turning my head, I beheld amongst other faces those of Father Francis, of Fousset, of the landlady of our dwelling, and lastly, of the Chevalier de Montenero. The last was a countenance I wished not to behold, and the one glance of his eye pained me more than all the busy whispering and observations of the mob. The officer of the Real Hacienda was now called forward, and immediately swore positively to my person, as well as to having tracked me through various turnings and windings to the end of the street wherein I lodged, from whence he saw me enter the house in which I was taken. He then clearly described the manner in which I had cast the body over into the water, and its state and situation when he found it, after having called the city guard to his assistance. At this moment the chevalier advanced through the crowd, and, passing round the table, took a seat beside the corregidor, who seemed to know him well. "'Will you permit me,' said he, addressing the magistrate, "'to ask this man a few questions? I am deeply interested in the young gentleman whom he accuses, and who, I feel sure, is incapable of committing an action like that attributed to him. Do you permit me?' The corregidor signified his assent, and the chevalier, without a word or a look towards me, proceeded to question my accuser with the keen and rapid acumen of one long accustomed to hunt out truth through all the intricacies in which human cunning can involve her. He did not, indeed, attempt to puzzle or to frighten him, but by what he wrung from him he gave a very different colouring to his evidence against me. He made him own that he had but seen me in the shadow, that I had never for a moment emerged into even the moonlight, and that when he arrived at the end of the street where I lodged, he was so far behind that he but caught a glimpse of my figure entering the house. The chevalier did more. He drew from him an acknowledgment that he had entertained some doubts as to which house it was, and then he argued how liable one might be to mistake the person of another under such circumstances. Even I myself, said the chevalier, in a tone of full meaning to my ears, even I myself have been sometimes greatly deceived in thinking I recognise those even I know best, when circumstances have afterwards proved that it could not have been them. And he glanced his eye to my face with a look that I could not understand. The man, however, still swore decidedly to my person, and my good friend, the pompous alguacil, probably to repay me for the disrespect with which I had treated him in the morning, now advanced and pointed out to the corregidor that my poor point had been washed in more than one place. This was quite sufficient. A loud murmur ran through the crowd. The chevalier clenched his teeth and was silent, and the corregidor's brow gathered into a heavy frown. But as he was in the very act of ordering me to be conveyed to the town prison, one of the doors behind him opened, and a servant, entering, whispered something in his ear. "'I cannot come now,' cried the corregidor hastily. "'I am busy, engaged in the duties of my office, and I will not be disturbed.' "'Then I am to give you this, sir,' replied the servant, and placing in his hand a small note, he bowed and retired. The corregidor opened the paper and glanced his eye over its contents. As he did so, his cheek became deadly pale, and the ball of his eye seemed straining from its socket, 
"'Wait, wait!' cried he at length to the alguacils. "'Wait till I come back!' And starting from his seat, he retired by the same door which had admitted the servant. As soon as he was gone, the restraint which respect for his person and office had before imposed upon the people seemed at once thrown off. The murmur of voices canvassing the whole affair became loud and general, and many persons advanced to look at me, though the officers would not allow any one to speak to me. The chevalier turned away, and walking to one of the windows, folded his arms upon his breast, and continued to look into the street, without offering me even a look of consolation. I understood all the doubts that now tenanted his bosom, and yet though I knew their cause, I felt hurt and offended that he should entertain them. In the meanwhile I heard the tongue of our good landlady, whose favour I had won by joking with her whenever I met her on the stairs, now loud in my defence. And however weak an organ may seem the tongue of an old woman, it, in this instance, by continual reiteration and replication, completely effected a revolution in the popular feeling towards me. So much so, indeed, that two monks, who had before been whispering that I ought to be given up to the Holy Inquisition, now took a different view of the case, and declared they believed me innocent. Half an hour, an hour, elapsed, and yet the corregidor did not return, during which time the feelings of my heart may easily be conceived. At length, however, he came, but never, before or since, have I beheld such a change take place in any man so rapidly. I have seen age come on by slow degrees, one year after another, stealing still some faculty or some power, till all was nothing. I have seen rapid disease wear quickly away each grace of youth, and each energy of manhood. But never but that once have I seen the pangs of the mind, in one single hour, change health and vigour and noble bearing to age, infirmity, and almost decrepitude. A murmur of astonishment and grief ran through the people, by whom he was much beloved. Casting himself recklessly in the chair, he turned to his secretary. "'Call the witnesses,' said he, "'that the accused proposed to adduce. "'This case is an obscure one. "'Take their evidence. "'I am not capable.' The clerk immediately desired me, in the name of the corregidor, to bring forward any persons who were likely to disprove the testimony against me. Father Francis was, of course, the first I called. He swore that I had left him, and entered my own chamber for the purpose of going to bed at ten o'clock on the night of the murder. He farther said that he had remained reading till one in the morning, and must have heard me if I had gone down the stairs, which, indeed, would have been the case if my step had been as heavy as it usually was. As to Usay, he swore through thick and thin, and, could he have known my wishes, would have witnessed anything I liked to dictate. In the first place he declared he had undressed me, and seen me in bed. In the next he vowed he had washed out several oil spots on my doublet the day before, and in the third that he lay with his door, at the top of the stairs, open all night, that he had never closed an eye till daybreak, and finally that I had certainly never passed that way. I might have gone out at the window, it was true, he observed, but that, my window being forty feet from the street, it was not very probable I should have chosen such a means of descent. I need scarcely say that though his deposition was assuredly a very splendid effort of genius, yet there was, nevertheless, not a word of truth in it. The next person I called was the landlady, who gave evidence that she found the door, which she had fastened the night before with various bolts, bars, and locks, which she described, exactly in the same state as that in which she left it, and, in the end, availing herself of her privilege, she turned round and abused my accuser with great volubility and effect. The uncertain wind of popular opinion had now completely veered about, and many of those who were behind me scrupled not to proclaim aloud that I had established my innocence. The news of which, spreading to a multitude of persons collected without, produced a shout amongst them, which seemed painfully to affect the corregidor. "'Hush!' cried he, raising his hand. 
hush i entreat i command this young gentleman is evidently innocent but do not insult my sorrow my good friends and fellow citizens he proceeded making an effort to speak calmly i have always tried to act towards you as a common father and i am sure that you love me sufficiently to leave me and retire quietly and in silence when i tell you that i have now no other children but yourselves my daughter is dead and covering his eyes with his hands he gave way to a passionate burst of tears a deep silence reigned for a moment or two amongst the people as if they could scarcely believe what they had heard then one whispered to another and dropping gradually away they left the audience chamber a momentary murmur was heard without as the sad news was told and commented in the crowd it also died away and all was silence but what were my own sensations i can hardly tell at first i stood as one thunderstruck with power to feel much but not to reason on it it seemed as if i had killed her and for long i could not persuade myself that i was in no way accessory to her death after a moment or two however my thoughts were interrupted by the corregidor who recovered himself and wiping the tears from his eyes rose and turned towards father francis your pupil sir said he in a calm firm tone is free but yet notwithstanding the melancholy event which has occurred in my family i will ask a few minutes private conversation with him as i wish to give him some advice which he may find of service he shall return home in half an hour signor conde de montenero he proceeded speaking to the chevalier i know you will pardon me in leaving you young gentleman will you accompany me the chevalier bowed and retired with father francis and doucet and the corregidor led me into a long gallery and thence into a private room beyond on the table lay my sword which i had left behind the night before forgetting it in the agitation of the moment the corregidor shut the door and pointed to the weapon with a look of that unutterable heart-broken despair which was agonizing even to behold the thoughts of all that had passed the lovely enchanting girl that he had lost his passionate affection towards her the knowledge he must now have of her crime the desolation of his age the void that must be in his heart the horrid absence of love and of hope the agony of memory i saw them all in that look and they found their way to every sympathy of my nature i must have been marble or have wept i could not help it and the old man cast himself upon my neck and mingled his tears with mine count louis said the corregidor after we had somewhat mastered our first agitation i know all my unfortunate child before the poison she had taken had completed her fatal intention told me everything her love for you your generous self-sacrifice to her all is known to me you pity me i see you pity me if you do grant me the only solace that my misery can have respect my poor child's memory promise me and i know your promise is inviolable never while you are in spain or to a spaniard on any account or for any reason to divulge the fatal history of which you are the only depository and even if you tell her story in other countries oh add that her crimes were greatly her weak father's fault who with a foolish fondness gave way to all her inclinations and thus pampered the passions that proved her ruin and her death i could not refuse him i promised and was glad at least to see that the assurance of my secrecy took some part even though a small one from the load of misery that had fallen upon him he spoke to me long and tenderly advising me to quit spain as soon as possible lest the inquisition should regard the matter as within their cognizance from the murdered man having been a priest at length i took leave of him renewing my promise and returned home with a heart saddened and rebuked but i hope amended and improved End of chapter ten